Well, hello. Um, I'm assuming everybody's in the room. It's, I, I was just saying to Zara, our tech person, that I'm not used to this, to this platform, so I can't see anybody. It's quite disconcerting. Um, welcome uh, to our plenary uh, uh, talk this afternoon. Um, my name is Catherine Kellogg, and I'm a, a professor and chair of the political science department uh, here at the University of Alberta. And it's my pleasure to uh, introduce Peter Russell. Um, I almost said who needs no introduction, so I'm going to give only a very brief introduction. Peter is Professor Emeritus in the Political Science Department at the University of Toronto. He's a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada. He's published widely in the fields of constitutional, Aboriginal and judicial politics. Recent focus has been on minority government and constitutional conventions related to parliamentary democracy. Now, his keynote this afternoon is called Patriation and Sovereignty, um, and he's going to speak for about 20 minutes. Uh, so we have lots of time for Q&A, um, and your questions are going to magically appear in front of my eyes where I'm going to try and read them aloud so that Peter can hear them. So uh, with, 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 with that, I'm going to turn the mic, so to speak, over to Peter. Thanks very much, Catherine. You can hear me loud and clear? Okay, good. Uh, thank you very much uh, for including me in this uh, very interesting conference on the legacies of patriation, uh, which occurred 40 years ago uh, when I was 50 years old. So that would give you, uh, you'll be doing the maths quickly in your head and figuring out what an old guy I am. However, there you are. Uh, and the title of what I want to say today, and uh, my original submission to the uh, conference organizers, uh, was I see patriation as the intersection of two, two decolonization projects. That's my way of thinking of it, the intersection of two decolonization projects. Now here's one. Canadians ended the legal status of their country being a colony of the United Kingdom, a British colony. They ended, uh, well, underlying the legal status uh, of being a colony. That's one. <laughs> decolonization project. The other, indigenous peoples within Canada began, began the process of ending their legal status as colonies of Canada. Of, as colonies of Canada. Now the decolonization celebrated by Canadians is for, is for, was formally complete, formally uh, complete in 1982 uh, in the sense that Canadians now had total control through their own domestic politics of the process of amending the written part, the written part of our their constitution. And maybe people listening today uh, who are unaware of that much more bigger and more and covering more crucial things than our, our written constitution in Canada or our, is the unwritten part of our constitution. But the amending the, the written part of our constitution can now be done entirely in Canada. Uh, now, I said it was formally complete. There, were, there still may be enduring non-legal legacies of Canada's connection to the United Kingdom. Uh, the legacies may be more informal, ceremonial, uh, but they remain. Now, that's the Canadian decolonization of Canada. The other decolonization is for Indigenous people. That's the other decolonization project. And for indigenous people, it's going to be very different because written constitutions were never part of their political culture 
of indigenous people's cultures. Their decolonization ambitions have taken them in a very different direction. So I'm going to talk now mostly about indigenous decolonization. Say a bit about it because it's still going on. It cannot be accomplished, first of all, by a collective act or agreement uh, of Canada with a bunch of First Nations or a majority of, indigenous, of the indigenous population. Just can't be done that way. Why? Because for First Nations, decolonization must be accomplished nation by nation. Similarly, Inu Inuit peoples and there are four Inuit peoples in Canada. They must do it one at a time and make their own agreements with Canada. And the same is true of the other part of our indigenous uh, population, the Métis people, the historic Métis nation. Uh, you can't do it for all of them in one grand sweeping document. It has to be done for much more piece by piece and gradually. In this respect, there's a similar aspect of Canadian decolonization. The province of Quebec has still not formally accepted the new Canadian constitution. I think some of your audience, much of your audience, I hope, is aware of that. Uh, it hasn't accepted the new Canadian constitution of all of the amendments approved by the other nine provinces back in 1982. Nevertheless, we, li we live with that fact of incompletion day to day, day to day. Now, let me say a bit about the instruments or the through or, or you might prefer the the language of paths or the paths along which indigenous decolonization has advanced. At first, the two main instruments were decisions of the Supreme Court of Canada and something that Canadians are the world's champions at holding constitutional conferences. Supreme Court decisions, constitutional conferences. Uh, I'm not going to take the time in this keynote talk to go over all the uh, gory details of what was and wasn't accomplished, what was and was not accomplished through these two processes, Supreme Court decisions uh, uh, and constitutional conferences. Some of you know much of our more about what they achieved and what they didn't than I do. I may raise points about that in the Q&A. But brief, briefly, briefly, let's recall Prime Minister Mulroney's very bold attempt through negotiations uh, with the provinces and Aboriginal leaders to put, I'm going to use a metaphor, to put flesh on Section 35 of the Constitution Act, the Patriation Act, the Constitution Act 1982. Section 35 was outside the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, and it, it recognizes and affirms, quote, recognizes and affirms, I hope you got those two words, quote, the existing Aboriginal and treaty rights of the Aboriginal peoples of peoples plural of Canada. Okay, uh, now that inclusion of a section in the Patriation Act of 1982 of a section entirely in Aboriginal people uh, that did result in a, a new constitutional and using the new constitutional amending formula um, that was in the Patriation Act. And we, it was used in 1965 to add uh, two subclauses 
to that section 35, uh, that, uh, one recognizing that rights gained through modern land claims agreements uh, could be uh, additions to Aboriginal rights, and another assuring that women's equality in any step, any step taken to clarify or add to the constitutional rights of Aboriginal peoples would be protect, protected. Right. From 1986 to 1992, Canada embarked on a heavy period of constitutional politics, the heaviest since our founding, uh, which we try, tried to get our constitution perfected our new con under our new amending formula. Uh, and that produced that, that period of constitutional politics resulted in the Meech Lake Accord and the Charlottetown Accord, long, big negotiated agreements. And here's the key, though, neither of which ever got the support needed to become law. So they were uh, experiences in frustration in trying to fix things up through the traditional mode of constitutional negotiation at conferences. Now, all, all that was going on, the Supreme Court of Canada was doing its work, handing down decisions in case after case, interpreting what does it mean to recognize the existing rights and existing right and treaty rights of the Aboriginal people. And it went some way to really making those rights fairly important, fairly full, but it didn't go all the way to recognizing in Canadian law what has to be recognized as a condition, as a condition of indigenous decolonization. And what is that? Here's the S word. That is the sovereignty of indigenous nations and peoples. Didn't Supreme Court felt it couldn't go that far. Give the indigenous people a lot of leeway to move in their own direction and govern themselves up to a point. Uh, but that point would always be determined uh, by a government with superior power in Ottawa and in provincial capitals. This crucial step in decolonization, the recognition of the sovereignty of indigenous nations and peoples, that step was taken finally by the Royal Commission on Aboriginal People. The Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples, known as RCAP. It sat from 1991 to 96, and its final re report recognized that Inuit, Inuit people, the Métis Nation, and First Nations, which we call Indian Nations, never surrendered, never surrendered the right to govern themselves. Such recognition of the inherent right of all peoples to self-government has usher, ushered in a process of treaty making between indigenous peoples and the government of Canada, uh, north of the 60th parallel and south of the 60th parallel, uh, negotiations between indig indigenous people, the government of Canada, and the relevant provincial government. And in these great treaties, these modern treaties, uh, agreement is reached on what we call a menu of governmental responsibilities that the Indigenous Party will take on and, re and resource themselves and the territory boundaries that they have agreed to uh, for the, as their Indigenous homeland. Treaties are and always have been. From our first dealings, we Europeans' first dealings, with Aboriginal people, treaties are agreements on how to share 
the land and waters of this vast country of ours. And they are and will continue to be the instruments of indigenous decolonization. Well, we 30 treaties, new treaties, and an active process of what is uh, referred to rather loosely as treaty renovation, a renovation of old treaties to go back to the mutually agreed understanding of those who entered into those agreements many, many years ago. Uh, so that process is going on uh, across in many parts of Canada, uh, especially in my province, Ontario. Uh, so much remains to be done. Indigenous decolonization is far from complete. Far from complete. In recent years, indigenous decolonization, however, has been advanced by two additional instruments, which I haven't mentioned. And they're very distinct. One is a Truth and Reconciliation Commission conducted by Indigenous peoples with 94 calls for action directed not only at governments, including municipal governments, religious bodies, uh, just civil society groups. 94 calls for action, some of which are political and have to do with completing indigenous self-government. Uh, that's one of the new instruments. This is a very important one. The second is a UN declaration, a United Nations declaration of the rights of indigenous people, UNDRIP, U-N-D-R-I-P, uh, that Canada has accepted at first haltingly under Stephen Harper, and then much less conditionally under uh, Trudeau, a uh, liberal government. Uh, and it's been accepted uh, by the government uh, as applying to Canada and through federal le legislation and British Columbia legislation, uh, there are commitments in Canadian statutory law uh, that embody commitments to implementing the 46 sections, 46 articles of under of the UN Declaration. So that's a lot of detail there. Uh, and you can see why I want to be brief. I, I, and I hope you can ask more detailed questions in the Q&A. Uh, so there you are. That's one guy, an older guy, thinking about the legacies of patriation. For other, others in Canada, the charter I know with all its bells and whistles may be the main legacy they're interested in. And that includes the notwithstanding clause. Uh, and recently, I, I be made aware, and maybe some of you have, of several conferences that we have held uh, in the last few months on the notwithstanding clause. Uh, Various places in Canada, how planning clause has been for French speaking nationalists, French speaking nationalists who strongly identify with Quebec as their First Nation, who are also strong federalists. And they're what keep us together. They're not separatists, they're Quebec nationalists, stroke dash federalists and notwithstanding clause as the key to what they must keep uh, to have this kind of self-government for Quebec that is essential uh, for them. It's interesting that I seem always to come back to federalism as the key to how the, the three pillars, English, speaking people, French speaking people, and indigenous people, the three, what I call the three pillars of this wonderful country of ours get along. Recognizing the sovereignty of indigenous nations and people in Canada may scare 
some people until you see how well our federal federalism accommodates its culmination uh, of self-rule and shared rule, which it does. Without federalism, we couldn't really honor uh, the recognition and recognize indigenous sovereignty. I just conclude with a personal note. I live in an old folks home with 420 people, and every, the strongest legacy here, we don't have one indigenous person in, in our wonderful home. It's called Christie Gardens. But the largest activist group by far of Christie Gardens, where I live, is the indigenous awareness group. Isn't that interesting? These are people who have been waking up, waking up to this decolonization that has been going on for over so many, over many decades. And at least once, twice, sometimes three times in a week, there'll be an indigenous event at Christie Gardens, usually involving an invitation uh, to an indigenous person to speak, uh, sometimes on Zoom or if, if possible in person, uh, or should we show indigenous movies that have been made? Uh, well, that's interesting. I think that is an extraordinary legacy uh, at the, the level of ordinary folks. Thank you very much. I think I should stop there. I'm right at 3.20. I said 20 minutes. Yes, you're, 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 you're astonishingly on time. Wonderful. <laughs> um, it's so interesting. I, I, of course, I know Christy Gardens quite well. My mom lived there for many years. So um, well, She was at Christy Gardens? Yeah, yeah. My, yeah. So, you know, sorry. Oh, my God. Is she, yeah. she, 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 no, she, she, she passed away a couple of years ago. But, yeah, yeah. she was there. For, for, it's it's oh. just funny because when you said you were in a retirement residence, I'm like, what are we saying Christy Gardens? Anyway, that's just me. Um, you've given us so much to think with. Um, and I'm sure there are many questions, no questions yet. Um, so I'm going to give the audience a little bit of time to start thinking about their questions. I have one. So maybe, oh, to, start, okay, okay. maybe to start things off. Good. You know, I mean, partly it's prompted because I thought you might be talking about your new book. So I mean, I, I mean the term sovereignty, of course, it's probably the most used and least understood term in the discipline of political science and maybe even in political life. So I guess my question is, it's a big question and so you don't need to answer it fully, but like, is it still, is it still the right term to be using given that self-rule is one of its many meanings? So, so it's, only, but it's only one of its meanings because it also means supreme authority, it means the miracle of self-making. I mean, it means many, many different things. So I'm just wondering, um, partly because I, I, I'm curious if you do this in the book, uh, I'm wondering if that's if, if it's a term who which maybe needs rethinking or um, even renovating. Well, thank you for that question about my book. Uh, I can best answer by uh, stating the full title of the book. Is sovereignty colon the biography of a claim exactly and what i found when i and i started off let me because the indigenous people uh got me going on this and i at the beginning of sovereignty the biography of a claim i tell the following story i was it's 1974, I hope I got the right year, uh, and I got uh, a phone call to come up uh, to Yellowknife and uh, uh, talk to some indigenous people. They're Daicho Dene. Daicho means big river, big river in Athabasca, and Dene means us, the people of the big river. Uh, and uh, they were negotiating, uh, beginning to negotiate an agreement with Canada 
that because Canada wanted to uh, build a pipeline down that big river from the uh, Beaufort Sea uh, right down into the United States of America. Uh, and they wanted to talk to me about some issues they thought. They said, we hear you're a constitutional expert. Come up here. And I walked into a room. I tell the story with six uh, indigenous leaders. And the first person to ask a question was the one woman. The other five were men. But she was, uh, she spoke first. And she asked me, Professor, I, what is sovereignty? Wow, I thought, that's a biggie. That's a real biggie. Uh, and in a second, really, knocked me for a loop. And how did the queen get it over us? How did the queen get it over us? Those are pretty basic questions. And I said, well, I, I, I know uh, the first, I teach that stuff at the University of Toronto in my political philosophy courses. And, um, uh, but on the second, I have Jack, absolutely no idea. It's the kind of thing lawyers should know all about. But the law school's closed right now. This is summertime. As soon as it opens, I promise, I'll go down uh, to the law school, knock on my colleagues' doors. They're very generous with their time. And put your question to them. How did the queen get it over us? So uh, I did that. And I tell the story, like five or six doors I knocked on, eminent people from Bora, Alaska, and to others maybe not, not so well known. and. Every time I got a, a, a response, uh, uh, the answer would be the same. Well, Peter, we really don't know how it happened, but it did. It did. We have it. We have it. And I thought to myself, well, that's not a very convincing answer. How the hell did we get it? And the, the penny finally dropped. Uh, I think you know, it's kind of six years later, uh, and I was, I was, I traveled around. I wanted to visit other places where Europeans had colonized indigenous people. Uh, and I was in Australia, and uh, I was taken to Discovery Point, which is on the south point of the main, uh, of the Torres Strait Islands, which lie between New Guinea and Queensland, Australia. And uh, we were looking at, we were at Discovery Point with an Aboriginal friend. And uh, he said, I said, why do they call it Discovery Point? Well, it's here that Captain Cook, who was cruising up the coast of what he referred to as New Holland, New Holland, um, uh, turned uh, and faced the mainland he saw. I didn't even know it was mainland, you know, it was an island, it looked, looked like a continent, all right. Uh, he, he couldn't see very far into it, but he said, I declare everything down there as belonging to my majesty, King George III, to which I said, my goodness, uh, that's ridiculous. Oh, no, my Aboriginal friend said. It isn't because what the lawyers do, uh, they get on the, the English British lawyers, they put on big black robes and they wear wigs, big wigs. Uh, and they're all dressed up and they go into court and they say it belongs to George III and Peter. They're backed up by a very strong army and navy that we can't resist. So the penny had dropped. That was the it that the queen had over us. And I began to see that sovereignty is something, uh, by tracing back its origin as a word, a 11 letter word, it's not just power or powerful, or it's a 11 letter word, right? I like to be precise. And it began as a word in Crankle Roman 
Europe in the early Middle Ages. It's got both a Frankish and a Roman derivation. And it was used at first, you won't be surprised, you we women listening, uh, by men in a family uh, to say they were the sovereign authority uh, over, they claimed sovereign authority over all their family, uh, all the members of the family, and all the land that they occupied. Uh, and it then starts to become uh, a political concept claimed eventually by states. So I face that in my sovereignty book. But it's always a claim. And it's a claim uh, that has always two dimensions to check, which are really important now with the Ukraine so much in our mind. Uh, one is effective. Uh, when you claim sovereignty, you claim to be the only legitimate authority in your land. And certainly Ukraine claims that, but it's not effective. It, it, it can't uh, keep the Russians out. The Russians have got in. That's only one dimension, though. <laughs> the other is the legitimacy. And you may be ineffective, <clears throat> but your people in your land and much of the world's peoples may see what you claim, you claim to be the only source of a legitimate government for your land and the people, they see that as legitimate, a legitimate claim. They may not be able to do much about it. Don't we wish we could do a hell of a lot more in Ukraine today and tomorrow? Uh, sure do. So I look at sovereignty as a claim. And, and testing it, its effectiveness and its legitimacy. I, I've talked uh, quite a long time about my book and then back to indigenization, uh, decolonization. I think their claim always had legitimacy, at least for their people, uh, at least for their people, not for the world's people. Uh, but now take the UN Declaration. The world is surely saying it's legitimate for the Hyde and the Mi'kmaq, the Métis, the, the Inuit to claim sovereignty. It is legitimate and it's becoming effective day by day. Uh, it's a long meandering. No, no, it's an that's actually a time to make this a question. So it's a, it's, a one, it's a wonderful answer. I have a couple of questions queued up here. Um, yeah. So I've got, I'll start with this one. As an Indigenous person myself, why or how do you think things have changed over time so that people are recognizing Indigenous peoples in ways now? And this person also wanted to thank you for the beautiful story about what's happening at Christie Gardens. Uh, well, I just uh, uh, go back to what I very briefly went over uh, in my talk. I think uh, uh, Canadian government has moved a long way, uh, a long way, uh, to uh, recognizing the rights of Indigenous people to negotiate the terms on which they share Canada with the rest of us. That, that's pretty big. Those 31 agreements uh, that I mentioned are, are new. And I, in Ontario, we've got the ring of fire in Treaty 3 and Treaty 9 land, and we're redoing those treaties. And they're fundamental uh, to the majority of people in the northern part of my province. We haven't completed the work. And that's, I don't, I don't want to use the word disappointing. I, I don't have a kind of thoughtful schedule of how fast things should be done. But my, one thing I'll share was I like to hear the indigenous person questions, response to this. I found sometimes the delay is government. That's for, uh, federal or provincial, most often provincial. Uh, but also it's often the indigenous people themselves or nation. They have a difficult time making decisions. Uh, that they're happy with. 
you know, they, in my experience at meetings of indigenous people, <laughs> it's very important, uh, not necessarily to get unanimity, but to have everyone speak, to have everyone participate, everyone over a certain age, and even elders, uh, if they can be got to the scene of the meeting. Uh, and it's often very difficult uh, for them to uh, get the kind of agreement, the, the, the degree of support within the community that they are comfortable with, let me put it that way. Uh, and, and that's nothing we can blame. We don't blame them for that. Uh, that's how they have lived through many centuries. Uh, it's, it's not easy. They don't really have representative government. We have elections, we represent people, uh, but they being basically smaller nations and peoples, uh, and they have had the political tradition of coming together and all uh, agreeing. And that's tough and it can hold things up. Thank you. Um, uh, I have a, another question here, a little bit different, that says, I'd love to hear Peter's assessment of the recent uses of Section 33. Have we entered a phase where it's becoming normalized? <laughs> oh, I see. Normalized. Oh, never. It, it is really a, a, a politically explosive thing, even to threaten to use. And I think it's being threatened too often uh, by governments uh, just to scare people into falling into line with what the government wants. Uh, and when it is exercised, in most circumstances, it's going to be a, a very uh, bold political act. Uh, you can, I think the evidence of that is the relatively few times it's been used since it's been available in 1982. Uh, uh, it, it, I know people are thinking of Quebec right now, and uh, they are going to use it um, uh, to require women in public service uh, not to cover their head. I think you know all about that, uh, and to protect that from charter, a charter challenge. Uh, and, and that's uh, uh, a politics of that are, are very lively, to say the least, inside and outside Quebec. Uh, I don't think there's any nor anything normal about that. I don't, it's not a whole hung, just another day for the no outstanding clause. Thank you. Um, so here's a question that you sort of touched on, but I guess um, people want to hear more. So this, the question is, you spoke of incomplete decolonization. And then the question, the question goes on, how can we speed up the process? What are the, how can, well, we, how can we speed, up, how can speed up the incomplete decolonization? What are the most important impediments to get there? Well, that's a great question that I should be thinking about more than I more than I do. Uh, uh, the contexts are all so different. I mean, I take my the context of Ontario, uh, where it's mostly a matter of treaty renovation. Um, and uh, well, uh, in a negative sense, we can pull all our weight by, against uh, the government of Ontario uh, pushing through a road over Treaty 3 and Treaty 9 land uh, to get access to the mineral deposits in what I call, what we call uh, the Ring of Fire. That's kind of negative. It's uh, because if we allow that to go ahead, we're really uh, really letting Indigenous people down. What? more than doing what we do at Christian Gardens. Uh, constantly, we, day by day, week by week, 
uh, even if we don't have a group, we a group today. We had two emails of interesting things happening uh, in, in uh, with indigenous people in Canada, one in BC and one in Nova Scotia, and it just uh, and so we we read it, we, we keep informed. Uh, uh, I, I got a call this morning that I'm going to respond to uh, from uh, the uh, uh, Mississauga of, we used to call it the credit, a new credit, we call it the credit, our largest Mississauga communities at Hagersville uh, on land uh, near Brantford, and they have a very uh, wonderful conference center there. And uh, I, I, I want to uh, rent a bus and take all we Christie Garden people over there. They have a they have a powwow every February. I think the the more we engage with Indigenous people and respond to things they ask us to do, I think we should be very responsive. We've been working hard here with uh, responding by letters. Uh, to the Prime Minister and Minister of Justice uh, about the over-criminalization of Indigenous people. And you might say, well, writing letters to Trudeau uh, and his minister aren't going to do very much. Well, what the hell else can we do? We work hard on those letters. We have people in and give us very, very accurate information about the over-incarceration of Indigenous people. Uh, and so our letter is informed. Uh, and we hope he sees this from a, a non-indigenous group of older people. It has some some effect. But I am wide open to suggestions of what we could do more. Oh, another thing is making sure I get my children and grandchildren uh, to visit and get friends in Aboriginal communities, as we tend to live apart. And I, I and we do that in the summer mainly. Around Georgian Bay, there are seven indigenous communities. I love doing that. The kids love it too. Yeah, I mean, I think the next question does link in here. So it's the indigenous person again, or I, an indigenous person again. Um, that is because, and I think this is a response to the question about the slowness of the decolonial project. That is because the framework is wrong. Canadian government and provincial government came into our communities and they frame agreements all wrong. If it was decolonial, they would begin to understand our process of unanimity and collaboration. So it's not exactly a, it's not really a question, but more of a comment. Um, and th that's just asking you to reflect on, um, well, exactly what it says. And I, I'm happy to reread it if you would like me to. Yeah, I'd like to reread it. Okay. So I think this is, this person is responding to your comment about the slowness of the decolonial process. And they're saying, and please, whoever wrote this question, please free, feel free to correct me if I'm getting this wrong. Um, the framework is wrong. Canadian government and provincial governments came into our communities and they frame agreements all wrong. If it was decolonial, they would begin to understand our process of unanimity and collaboration. In other words, the process of de decolonization undertaken by uh, a provincial and, and federal governments is already um, uh, unable to understand the unanimity and collaborative nature of uh, the agreements. Well, I, I totally agree with that. Uh, but I like your question right to, uh, oh, well, let me put it this way. I don't know of a negotiation that, as you put it, or she puts it, or she puts it, is led by and framed, framed by the federal and provincial government. Uh, maybe uh, I've only been involved in one agreement, and it's the interim agreement north of 60 with the Dachel Dene, and certainly uh, uh, that wasn't framed uh, in that case by the federal government. Uh, it was very intricately negotiated because I was a negotiator um, back and forth uh, between Ottawa and the Mackenzie Valley. So, uh, but maybe I, I missed, and there are some where 
the federal and provincial government, maybe both of them or one of them, comes in with uh, already made up his mind what's how how to frame the agreement. Okay, this one's, thank you. There's a, this one's a little bit different. It starts, thank you for a fabulous lecture. You once asked in one of your magisterial works whether Canadians can constitute themselves as a single sovereign people. So this is the question. Must this necessarily be our aspiration as Canadians? Uh, well, that's, a, that's a really good question. Uh, I don't people speakers say that too often, but I really mean it. But here's how I think of it. Uh, Canada is one of the 193 sovereign states in the, that make up the United Nations. The United Nations Charter, its members must be sovereign nation states. And we're in there, one, one, we're one of the 193 and have been for a long time, virtually from the beginning of the UN. Uh, so we're a sovereign state in that international sense. But the exercise of sovereign powers within the country, I'll repeat that phrase, because this is crucial. The exercise of sovereign powers, the powers of a sovereign state within the country are divided, are divided between provinces, and the central government, and now between provinces and the central government and indigenous peoples. Indigenous peoples have a share of that sovereignty is the sovereign powers of a sovereign country. And we didn't remember, I didn't say we were a sovereign people. I didn't singularize, I didn't want to ignore the diversity uh, of our population and make them all one big glob. Uh, uh, the powers of the, are, are divided and are exercised, some of them uh, are exercised by in, independently uh, by provinces, not by territories. Territories haven't been conceded uh, independent sovereign powers. But provinces have had that since Confederation. And the federal government has a share of sovereign powers, as mostly in Section 91, as all you who have gone to law school will know. Uh, there's a big list, and there are additions to that list in other sections of the Constitution Act, uh, 1867, uh, uh, that are in it, powers that can't be taken away by the provinces can be whittled down. Some of them, there's overlap and there are doctrines of paramountcy when there's overlap of who's in paramount uh, and uh, federal and provincial. Now indigenous people are into that kind of uh, uh, sharing of sovereign power with Canada and the provinces. And, and it's, uh, they need, one thing that, that they need and are getting because their young people are going to law schools, <laughs> and they need their own lawyers uh, to uh, understand what they have and uh, and make sure it's respected. Uh, but more and more, we see I see First Nations uh, well served by their own people who've uh, studied our kind of law as well as Indigenous law. Okay, this might be lost, but we'll see how this goes. But I have a, a question that's sort of a compound question that kind of comes back to the frame of the, of the lecture, which is, was there not a profound tension between the two projects of decolonization that you refer to during patriation? In other words, did Canada's ambitions of full sovereignty not contradict or even deny Indigenous ambitions of decolonization? And then it's a second part, which is, how do you think these simultaneous projects could work in tandem instead of in tension? Well, I think there was tension. I think the question is quite right. Uh, I think I'm not an NDPer. I'm a Green member. But I think 
Ed, the NDP under Ed Broadbent uh, deserves a lot of credit and uh, forcing the indigenous issue onto the negotiation table that eventually produced the Constitution Act 1982. Uh, indigenous people uh, were, as you know, they, they came to Ottawa, they stormed Parliament Hill, uh, took it over even more than those con convoy of anti-vax truckers, uh, but they still weren't at the table. Uh, but the, um, the NDP, uh, politically, though Trudeau had a majority, politically, Trudeau really wanted the NDP to support the patriation project. And for Ed Broadbent, that meant correct to be a Section 35. Uh, so th that's certainly tension and uh, sort of uh, overcome or managed or got around uh, by an astute political leader. I, I don't mean just Ed. I, I, he carried his caucus with him. Um, so uh, I think that's the main answer. Since then, uh, I don't think the two projects have really been much on the collision course as I read our history. Uh, I don't, if you, if you look at indigenous, indigenous people in Quebec, uh, they've done fairly well in getting their rights and interests uh, recognized. Uh, not at first, uh, but uh, uh, René Levesque, for instance, uh, who I think your audience will remember, who uh, was a pretty bold uh, nationalist Quebec leader. Um, he really uh, was, of all the premiers, uh, I think the most understanding of why the indigenous people needed their sovereignty recognized. He understood that, and he wasn't against it, and he was willing to enter into agreement, mainly up north with the James Bay Cree, and also the Inuit people of Inuit. Well, I think that brings us to the end of our conversation today, Peter. It's been an absolute joy to listen to you and have you uh, respond to the question from the audience. So on behalf of everybody, I want to thank you for this uh, wonderful keynote presentation and yeah. um, and and for the, the, the taste of the book. Because okay. I, I, wanted, I, wanted I wanted you to tell that little, that little hey, anecdote. Uh, we're, we're, you're very nice handling of this whole interview. Oh, I really well. appreciate it. All right. Thank you. And uh, Bye. Bye-bye.